Good evening. Good evening. I'm Andrea Bursler for Carroll County Public Library. On behalf of CCPL and our friends at a Likely Story Bookstore, it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. Laura Lippman has been a reporter for 20 years, including 12 years at the Baltimore Sun. She began writing novels while working full time and published seven books about accidental PI Tess Monahan before leaving daily journalism in 2001. Her work has been awarded the Edgar, the Anthony, the Agatha, the Seamus, the Nero Wolf, Gumshoe, and Barry Awards. She has also been nominated for other prizes in the crime fiction field, including the Hammett and McCavey. She was the first ever recipient of the Mayor's Prize for Literary Excellence and the first genre writer recognized as Author of the Year by Maryland Library Association. Here are a few fun Carroll County facts about Laura. She was the first author to headline CCPL's Day for Book Lovers 10 years ago this September. And she was also the very first author to speak at a Likely Story bookstore in July of 2006. She will be interviewed by Angela Helt, a freelance writer and full-time health editor in DC. Her pieces have appeared in publications including Express, various Washington Post sections, Women's Health Magazine, USA Today, and Vice. Please join me in welcoming both Laura and Angela to our program tonight. Hello. Well, Laura, what a treat it is to be here with you today. And let me just start off by saying I love this book. Um, it resonated with me from literally the very first page. Um, and I think that's going to be or already has been the case for many, many people. So first of all, you've released a lot of books, but this is the first time you've done so in the midst of a global pandemic. Tell us, what has that been like having this book go out when you can't, you know, go do these in-person events? You know, what's this experience been like for you? It was interesting. The book was originally supposed to come out in May and they delayed it because of COVID. And then it became clear that it would have to be this new thing called a virtual book tour. And as extroverted as I am, as much as I love travel, I gotta tell you, I'm kind of a fan of the virtual book tour. First of all, the virtual book tour is open to everybody. Mm -hmm. I were doing this event for Debbie's amazing store in Sykesville. But there are people who can attend, even if they're hundreds of miles from Sykesville. I like that. I like the fact that, you know, I click in and then when I click out, I'm back on my sofa within five minutes with yep. my kids. <laughs> and it's, it feels a little dangerously cliched and banal. And I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna because I recognize that the pandemic has thrust a lot of people into a situation where they don't have the privilege of examining any silver linings. There is no silver lining for a lot of people. And that's really important to talk about. But for those of us who are privileged enough to say, okay, can I learn something? What do I need to know now that I didn't know a year ago? Is I realized that I was wasting so much time before. Oh. Churn, all this movement and all this worry and like, there's not enough time, there's not enough time, there's not enough time. And then all of a sudden, there was all the time in the world, except it was the same amount of time. <laughs> and you know, it was like, like when it was 24 hours before, it's 24 hours now. What changed of course was my own concept of time and how I was using it. And so I'm a fan of the virtual book tour. You know, I, I think like even six months ago, I was probably chomping at the bit to get out of the house and to see other people and to be with someone other than my kid, who's the person I'm with the most often. And then all of a sudden I was with my kid all the time. And I was like, you know what? If I have to be with one person all the time, this is the person I want to be with. And I do miss other people and I do miss a lot of things, but virtual book tours, I think that we're going to, going to learn some things about how to do book events. And some vestiges of this may be with us once we're in to our post-COVID reality, whatever that is. Yeah. 
Well, we'll get back to the new book in a second, but speaking of using your time, I mean, have you been writing a lot during this time? Or are there other things you've been, you know, other new hobbies or interests that, you know, that you've been excited about? So I had a book that was due, it was a teeny bit overdue when the pandemic started. And I got that done by June 1st. Wow. Well, it was, like I said, it took me 16 months and I was beating myself up over that. Like it shouldn't take 16 months. Why did it take so long? Then I realized, okay, wait a minute. Remember in the middle of writing this book, you put it aside for three months and did nothing but write essays for villainous. Mm -hmm. And I wrote two short stories and I was doing all these other things. So the past, let me think. Okay, so June 1st, I turned my book in. That's my next novel, which will be out next year. Okay. And then by the time I got notes back from my editor in the United States and my editor in the UK, and by the time I did those notes, now it's sometime around, I feel like it must have been like two weeks ago that I finally turned in my revision. And now I'm just sitting here kind of waiting for my copy edit. And I am doing almost nothing. Oh, well, that must be a nice change of pace. It's fantastic. <laughs> Doing nothing is wonderful. I feel like, why, like, how long has this been going on? Yeah. <laughs> and I've also kind of changed in terms of how I evaluate the things I'm asked to do. I'm always, I'm always so flattered when someone asks me to do anything. I'm like, of course I'll do it. But now I've really tried to just take on projects of the heart. So the only two yeses I've said in the past two months, one was to write an afterword for a new edition of Marjorie Morningstar. Talk about my heart right there. Uh-huh. And I was asked to write a short story for kids. Oh. I said yes only after I convinced my daughter to collaborate with me. Oh my gosh. Project. So, and, and so I have nothing to do right now. I mean, I've done the short story, the afterward to Marjorie Morningstar is done. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I am just a crazy person. I'm reorganizing kitchen drawers. I mean, today I literally went through the stack of New Yorkers and mm-hmm. organized them so they, they're in chronological order with the most recent date going back. Oh, how, a- how satisfying. Three years of New Yorkers. Yeah. Still never going to read them all. I don't even know whether. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you are experiencing the joy of doing nothing. Everybody needs to experience that at some point. So tell us, you know, you're obviously known for your crime novels. What made you decide to release these essays, especially given, you know, as you know, you have a distaste of the first person. So tell us how this all came to be. You know, it's funny because I mean, I know you're really familiar with book tours and writers, and we've talked before. So I had one very definite answer to this up until a week ago. And then I realized it was kind of inaccurate. I, I believed until a week ago that I began writing personal essays two years ago as sort of a, a challenge I issued myself to see if I could place essays in prominent prestigious places because a lot of marketing a novel now is trying to draw attention to the novel by writing essays. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to do that, I want to write the best essays for the best places. And this was all true that I made a game plan. But one of the things I had forgotten is that back in 2013, my very good friend, Lizzie Skernick, an amazing writer and editor, this is when medium.com is first starting up. And at the time, she actually had like her own little magazine on Medium and she had money. And she said, and, and it was like, the, I feel like it was a good rate. It was like a respectable rate. And she said, I will pay you to write an essay every month. And I didn't think about those as personal essays. I thought about them as just quirky things that were on my mind mm-hmm. about the fact that um, I wrote, the first essay I wrote was called Female in Public which is about men or real old men really, really like to get time. That's just a thing. I wrote about what happened when our house almost caught fire. And I just, it was, there were these very quirky, idiosyncratic essays. And I wrote them as long as Lizzie had the contract and could pay me. And then when the contract went away and 
her her magazine her magazine went away, I stopped. But Lizzie deserves a lot of credit for sort of luring me in. Mm -hmm. So I deserve credit. Uh, an editor writer friend named Sean Manning, who around the same time said to me, "Well, will you write a piece about a bar?" write a piece about your favorite bar. I'm like, okay, sure, that sounds easy. And I, I knew instantly that I would write about the brass elephant. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know as I would end up writing a bar about, I'm gonna tear up a little bit, it's still, about my relationship with my dad, who by then wasn't doing that well, and was kind of becoming frail. And I, I don't say that in the essay, but I think it's pretty much there. And that's in the book. Yes. And my friend Anne Hood, who would later become a subject of one of the essays in the book, she asked me to write about knitting. She said, can you write about knitting? I'm like, sure, because I used to say yes to everyone. <laughs> sure. And I started writing about these Christmas stockings that my mother made for every kid in the family, like starting with her niece, and, and she's still going. And I wrote about the stocking that she made for my daughter and this kind of weird sequence of events that emanated from that you know first of all the problem was that you know we're raising my daughter as a jew mm -hmm. <laughs> but also that in the process of committing myself to raising my daughter as a jew i began to realize that i would kind of become an atheist in spite of myself like i don't want to be an atheist i really don't want to be an atheist <laughs> um, and and so i began learning that writing personal essays for me is about you think you're writing about one thing and you start with this very concrete idea I'm going to write about blank and you sort of just jump in and you're like mm -hmm. oh, I had no idea this is what I was writing about and that's pretty much true of every essay in this book you know Game of Thrones mm -hmm. I want to write about being an old mom the whole 60. I want to write about how I gave up dieting. You know, it's like, and I had no idea what I had to say about any of these things other than that I was pretty sure I would have something to say. That's so interesting. And all of those essays you just mentioned, like the one um, about stealing your dad's bar for those who haven't read it yet. I mean, it was terrific. And I, I see exactly what you're saying, but also through your essays. I mean, you write so candidly that you really feel like we readers know you and know your family and you know who you're going with so uh, you know what you're going through um so i really enjoyed that but you know let's talk about the title my life as a villainess how did you come into your villainy <laughs> you know tell us a little bit about what the title means to you so my life as a villainess is the title of an essay that was written i gotta do some math here it was written over 10 years ago, it might be almost 15 years ago. Yeah, I think it was 15 years ago. I wrote it for a book called Bad Girls, edited by Ellen Sussman. And it was published by Norton. And the lawyers at Norton flagged it. And they uh -huh. said, you're worried that you have exposed yourself to legal problems in writing this essay. It was an essay about my divorce from my first husband and how utterly ruthless I was in pursuing the divorce settlement I wanted. And at the time it made me nervous. I, I could have fixed it back then if I thought about it. And I did make small changes all these years later. But the main thrust of that essay, and it's meant to be arch, you know, I don't really think I'm a villainess. And the very word villainess is kind of a tip, right? You know, that no one calls himself that. No one, it, no one calls themselves a villain or a villainess. But in being willing to write about the end of my marriage and at the very end of the essay say, if I think about this from my ex-husband's point of view, I have to accept that every day I wake up in someone else's story where I'm not the good guy. Mm -hmm. Bad guy, right? Right. right. I mean, and by the way, I don't even actually know that for a fact. I don't, for all I know, because I, I haven't spoken to him since our marriage ended. Right. There's just no reason to. We don't have a kid. We split everything up. We went our two separate ways. 
for all I know, he's a generous person who's forgiven me. I, mean, I left him and I wasn't, I wasn't committed to fixing our marriage. I didn't, I was not a, a good girl. So for all I know, he's forgiven me. But in the essay, I was like, I have to accept that maybe every day I'm wandering around in somebody else's story where I'm the, the bad guy. And that was such an interesting idea to me because first of all, I'm such a lifelong good girl, real goody goody. And also the idea that I don't control all the stories. There are all these versions. And so that's where my life and illness came from. You know, the, the collection was inspired. My editor came up with the idea, my longtime fiction editor, Carrie Huron, came up with the idea after she saw these pieces I was publishing last year at Long Reads. And the breakthrough piece was a, the second piece in the book, Game of Crones, which is about me being old. And at that point, we were going to call it Game of Crones. And someone said, you know, by the time the book comes out, the cultural reference is going to be a little dated. It's going to be stale. And I agreed. And I said, well, how about my life as a villainess? And I do think it's arch. I, I don't, I don't think I'm a bad person, but I've really made peace with the fact that I'm not always a good person. And I, I think that's kind of crucial for your humanity to be able to say, I was the bad guy in that person's story. Right. And I, you know, as, a, as a novelist, I've always been really clear on that, but to, to sort of suck it up as a human and, and be able to say, yeah, and that person's story, I'm the bad guy. I just am. And I don't need to argue it. And I don't need to, to sort of let it go. Then, and so that's where that essay came from. And, you know, it was an essay that it yeah, is like kind of almost literally in a drawer. And I pulled it out. Well, speaking of coming to peace with that, you know, I mean, it seems from the book, you've come to peace with a lot. You are a very self-accepting person at that, this point, you know, thinking about everything from, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, you can be your age and wear whatever bathing suit you want. You know, you've come to peace with, you know, you seem like a very self-accepting person. So talk a little bit about that and how you have managed to reach this point of being somebody who is like, yes, I am a knockout. I did write that. And I loved writing that. And I, and I wrote about it again today on Twitter. And I said to people, every time a woman says she likes the way she looks, the patriarchy dies a little bit. Trust me on this. Trust me on how much of our economy, how much of our culture is dependent on women hating themselves. So, and I had kind of gone into a little trough a couple years ago. It's like, oh, I'm getting older. I don't feel good about myself. My body is changing. <laughs> At this point, you recognize that it sounds so simple and it's so hard, but you really do have this power right there. It's very Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. You always had the power. It's always been there with you where, yeah, you can go on another diet. You can go spend money on whatever beauty treatment you want. You can go spend $10,000 on an award, whatever you want to do. You can do all those things. And if, by the way, if you really want to go do them. But the one thing you can definitely do right now is you can say, you know what? I love the way I look. And you have to, it's, it's everything around us has encouraged us to never say that. Not only because, you know, it's like, you know, every magazine has pointed out to you every single way in which you're flawed, but because confident women really piss people off. Like, how dare you? How dare you? I mean, you know, I think part of it is that perversely, it was realizing that there were trolls on the internet who were telling people like, you know, Charlie's Theron that she wasn't hot enough. You're like, okay, if that's the standard, that's great. I'm free. I'm liberated. <laughs> I, I, you know, sort of like, it, there's always going to be somebody who's willing to tell you you're not pretty enough. You're not this enough. You, you, you know, trust me, you can definitely find someone who will run you down. Oh, yeah. 
always. <laughs> um, but to sort of say, you know what, I, I began, it's almost like a mental exercise. Like, I love the way I, I like my face. I mean, by the way, I can tell <laughs> all of its flaws. I'd be happy to enumerate them. But I'm like, you know, I kind of like it. I like the way I look. I know what is, you know, I know what kind of genetic lotteries I've won because it's really important to talk about this stuff with genetic lotteries because of what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know which ones I've lost. And, but why not just talk about the ones I won? And why not just be really happy and content in my body? And, you know, something I found out writing this book is that any topic that I took on and took to completion for the book, mm-hmm. I was at peace with. I was, and you know what, before, and I, you know, there's an exact date in the book, before September of 2018, mm-hmm. I'm not at peace with my body. And I would give anything to make peace with my body decades ago. Didn't get to do it. Before yeah. I started writing about being an older mom and also kind of a de facto single mom just by circumstance. I wasn't at peace with that. And then when I finally wrote the essay, which really does emphasize strength. I mean, you know, it ends with this image of myself thinking that I'm going to take this garbage bag and like, you know, have, <laughs> which I didn't do. But like, uh, that's how I want my daughter to see me as, right. strong, as capable, as unflappable, as not letting anything get me down. Every essay in the book represents me finding peace with the topic within, whether it's menopause, whether it's about a topic that we don't write enough about, which is envy among writers, and sort of following the journey I had from envying someone wildly to having that person become one of my best and dearest friends, Anne Hood, such, you know, to my very complicated feelings about how we mourn celebrities and whether... When we mourn celebrities, are we taking up space that the people who really knew them need? And I, you know, have this sort of, I, I keep talking about my friend-in-law, Tony Bourdain. Tony was not my friend, but he was very much my husband's friend. Yeah. And when Tony died, it was like hard to find space to mourn because everybody else rushed in. Yeah. And again, it was like, okay, everything I wrote about I realized when I got to the end of the essay, you're okay with it. And the hardest essay on that score was writing an essay about what a crappy friend I am. I mean, that's not, that's not something we talk about. I, like, I have not met a lot of people who are like, yeah, I'm a really shitty friend. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going to fail you. I'm going to let you down on this. But I have been a crummy friend to a lot of people. And... Some of them have called me out on it and forgiven me. Right. And some of them have called me out on it and not really forgiven me. And some of them have just let me go as a friend. Yes. Well, I thought that was really interesting that you talk about that, you know, when the friendship ends and there's the dialogue exchange. I mean, that's one thing. But when somebody just kind of, when a friend ghosts you, I mean, that's a painful thing to grapple with. And that really made me think a lot about that and how that just leaves those, you know, how do you come to peace with that? So I thought that was a really interesting point that you raised there. You know, I, I, I'm pretty sure about this. If you went to a bookstore, unfortunately we can't go to bookstores right now, but you know, if you can remember the time when we used to be able to go into bookstores and browse the shop. Although actually I think you, oh, wait, no, we can do that in some places. We can do that at Likely Story. Debbie was just telling us that they're doing a great job and people are social distancing and her store is open for browsing, just not events. But if you went into Debbie's store and you went to, if they have a self-help section, Mm -hmm. not a lot of books on being a friend. No, no. You know, your relationships with your parents, your relationship with your kids, almost every relationship that humans have have tons of books written about how to do them better. And since Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which was obviously the title that I ripped off from my essay on friends, we haven't really talked about that being a friend is not a natural instinctive thing to be. 
it, it doesn't come naturally. And we sort of act like, well, if my friendship's not working, then I should just be out of it. Right. And I don't know, maybe friendships require care and sending like any other relationship. Right. I say that because I'm the person who's failed to do the care and tending. I feel like being the, the bad friend, being the person who has failed so many people and has screwed up so many times allows me to kind of call out friendship as a concept because I'm not holding myself up as, and I'm so good at it. I'm like, yeah, you know, this is um, hard. And I have really sucked at it and I have failed a lot of people in my life. It, just, it seems when people are aware of, you know, those shortcomings that they can often, you know, you're conscious of them, you can work to overcome them. I mean, do you see yourself evolving and becoming more of what you would consider, you know, not a crummy friend? Um, I'm really bad at that. Like, I want to tell you, and yes, I'm doing better uh it depends on the friend you know it really depends on the friend and what i can provide and you know one of the friends who's mentioned in the essay and i've talked about her before she's we've known each other the longest of all my friends and i don't think mm -hmm. she's my oldest friend but we've right we have been friends now for i have to do math We've been friends for 45 years because we met as, our, in, as teenagers. And she is someone who I let down years ago. She forgave me. I still have to sort of work at not shutting her out sometimes. You know, one of the things and it's mentioned in the essay is that when things are bad for me, I don't talk to my friends. I, I don't, it's, which is weird because your friends want to help you when things are bad. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Nancy is someone who's really important to me and I feel closer to her now than I have in years, even if we still like, talk about every three months or send each other the occasional text. I, you know, I have another friend who's not even mentioned in the book who was my dearest, dearest friend when we were in our 20s. We went through a lot. I won't even detail it all. I got on the phone with her the other day and it was the most lovely, satisfying, terrific conversation. Yeah. That of, this is why you love her. She's so smart. She's so interesting. She's just so ready to sit here and have a wonderful conversation about everything that's happening. It's like, why is it so damn hard? to pick up the phone and make that call. Why do we, I think what part of what's happened is that the telephone feels very important now, yes. right? Yep. It's like the telephone is for, and you, it's like, it's like something bad has happened. Well, it's Let's a capital letter event. Yep. And um, I think we need to like take the phone back as I, I want to go back to be yeah. that teenager who, you know, with, <laughs> Lie on the rug with the telephone, you know, the cord wrapped half of yes. <laughs> Like talk for three hours to somebody because that's, you know, that's what life was like when I was a teenager. And I don't think that texting like gets there. No, uh, you lose something in that. Yeah. Yes. Much less personal. In that intense one on one moment. And the, and I also, you know, just sort of just just listening to a voice. Just mm -hmm. being on the voice, I think, would be a yeah. thing. Now, you write about all of these very universal experiences that I think a lot of people, especially women, can relate to. I'm curious what you hear. And, you know, you talk in the book about how you have, like, your Twitter community and you have these different, you know, groups of people, your book friends. You know, do you get lots of, you know, and especially after publishing some of these essays, do you get lots of letters saying, you know, thank you, you've articulated what I've always felt, you know, that type of thing. Or, you know, what do you hear from people? Game of Thrones definitely had that effect. I heard from so many moms. And what blew me away was there were moms just like me. I was like, there's no mom like me. There's no one out there who's 60 with a nine year old. This is crazy. And I was like, you know what? Go figure. I heard yeah. from 60 year olds who had nine year olds. So I hear that. Um, I do hear from my friends. 
I, I really thought Game of, Game of Thrones in particular, I felt almost like I was running a victory lap at school drop off. Yeah. I felt like every mom there was like, yes. Um, what's <laughs> interesting, um, much less feedback about the essay Tweety Bird, which is about what happened when I got mm -hmm. called to the principal's office for me and Tweety. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, one, but oh, that was so, hilarious. <laughs> oh, so sure. I know which moms got me in trouble. I'm so sure about that. <laughs> you know, it's, um, I do get, I do hear from people and it's very moving and it's very touching. Obviously I heard from a lot of people when I wrote about friendship because a big portion of that essay is about my friend Rob Hyacin, who was murdered. He was a reporter at the Annapolis Capitol. He was one of the five people who was killed at his workplace. And that's something that people respond to. Mm -hmm. And that was, that, that was something where I was so nervous about being accused of exploiting his death. You know, the, from the, I mean, like literally almost from the minute that we knew Rob had been killed, I was being asked to comment on it, to write about it because I'm, somewhat high profile and I, I maybe I, tw I must have tweeted about it which is how people knew and the New York Times asked me to write an op-ed piece about it and then I wrote this piece and I feel like there was another piece I know that I made a point of donating any money I got writing about Rob went to the coalition to stop gun violence which is the um, nonprofit that his wife Maria Hyacin had, you know, made her mm -hmm. pause. But, you know, you still worry that, you still worry that you're making it all about you. And that's an overlap between two of the essays, the essay about friendship and the essay about um, celebrity death is how do we talk about the people we lose without making it about us? This thing really concerns me. I've been to, unfortunately, because of my age, I've been to a lot of funerals. I've been to a lot of memorial services. I've heard a lot of people give talks that are about them and not about the dead person. And, and I mean, I get it. You're trying to explain how much the dead person meant to you. That's natural. That's normal. That is fine. But I have heard so many speeches at different memorials, not at Rob's, which I, I feel like I have to make that clarification because one person said, oh, who is the person who spoke so badly at Rob Hyacinth's memorial service? Well, nobody. Oh I, never heard that. Um, I was trying to be quite covert about the memorial service at where I um, heard speeches that made me unhappy. Um, where people just t end up talking about themselves. And I, I mean, I wrestled with that when my father died and uh. we, we threw a very, um, we threw a party at my father's club in Baltimore, open bar, hors d'oeuvres. And um, I, I wrote a eulogy for my dad and I think it was very much about my dad, but the memory that sticks with me is that no one else wanted to speak after I spoke. And my husband said, um, you know, you should have let other people go first because that was too good. And now no one wants to say anything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I wasn't really thinking about that, but yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I did get feedback about Rob because everybody loved Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was very meaningful to me that his brother Carl wrote me. Uh, I think I tell the story in the essay. I can't even remember anymore. But the way that Rob Hyacin and I met was I knew that the paper had hired this guy named Rob Hyacin. And I'm pulling my car to the parking garage on his first day of work. And here comes this impossibly tall. He's impossibly tall. I think he was six foot six, six foot seven. And I said, are you Rob Hyacin? He's like, yes, I am. And I said, are you? 
And he would later tell me that in that split second, he just assumed I was going to ask about his brother, who's well known as a novelist. I said, are you the reporter who wrote that amazing series about the dentist in Florida who infected all his patients with HIV? And from that moment on, Rob said he loved me. <laughs> like, oh you know, my so gosh. Good friends. And, um, you know, so everybody loved Rob. You, you, you could not, I, I wouldn't trust a person who didn't love Rob Hyacinth. He was a really special person. And so that was something where I heard from a lot of people. Um, I've become a little bit of a, a menopause whisperer as a result of the book. Yeah. You come up to me, I'm like, let's talk about it. Let's, like, let's stick it out. Let's talk about it, folks. <laughs> Have it on top of the population. And I don't understand why this topic has been driven underground and we know nothing about it. Um, you know, people, it, and people still, you know, want to, it, it, one of the things, I can't remember if I put this in the book or not. I have a website, duh, because I've been around for 20 years. And um, it has frequently asked questions. And the very last question on my fact page is, the question is, will you forward my email to David Simon? And it's like, no, absolutely not. Oh and, um, you know, so I'm so used to that happening. And just this week, a friend got in touch with me and I thought, oh, this is going to be an ask that's not for me. But I was completely wrong in my cynicism. Like a beautiful, wonderful thing that he was asking me to do. And I like cried. I was like, oh my gosh, you want me to do <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, you mentioned your husband. Um, tell us what it's like to be living with an actual genius. You would have to ask him that. <laughs> well, there, and that proves the point that you are the <laughs> funny one. <laughs> Which I, there are, <laughs> there are many, many parts of the book where I did laugh out loud. So yes, I think. Um, <laughs> so, okay, we're getting some audience questions rolling in here. So let me just pause for a second. Um, we have a question from Sharon who says, you know, was it difficult to write these about these very personal parts of your life or was it cathartic? You know, wh what was that like for you? Difficult or cathartic? Largely cathartic. The difficulty was finding my way into every topic. I would pick a topic and then I had so many false starts. Someone I was talking to last week, I think it was Alice Bolin, paid me the highest compliment, which is she said that my essays are sort of structured like Simpson episodes where the first part isn't what it's about. And I <laughs> thought that was like really flattering and also mm -hmm. really insightful because like if you look at um, the whole 60, it begins with this discourse about me reading books in secret in the Walden Books in Columbia Mall. Um, menopause begins with, uh, the essay about menopause begins with a description of my high school education and this weird class I took on evolution. You know, I found I had, you know, the essay about Anne Hood begins with me talking about the 80s and how crummy the clothes were and how much I loved them. <laughs> so finding those beginnings was really, really hard. It would be because that's, those aren't, aren't the obvious places to start. I mean, Game of Crones, I pitched it in December of 2018. And, um, Sorry, who is my editor at Long Reads, was really like, you know, casual, like, you know, if you can get it to me by March, I think she said it had to be March, that would be fine. And I had so many false starts. I like found some of them the other day, which was fascinating. Oh. And um, the fact of the matter is, a Game of Crones, it turned out I hadn't even lived it yet. That most of that essay would come out of what happened to me in February of 2019. So I don't know if I found them cathartic per se, but I definitely didn't find it hard to share what I shared. Huh. You, know, I, you know, I'm pretty candid, but I don't tell people everything. I tell people what I want to tell them. Right. And things that don't embarrass me, they just don't. And I would say probably the biggest challenge 
the thing I had never really talked about was menopause. It's this big, heavy word. Women are kind of discouraged from embracing it. And I go all the way to like, you know, hey, I'm a goddess. I'm not really, I like everything is fabulous, but it was also like, it's just a thing. It's just a rite of passage. And I hated, I, I, I told someone recently that the problem with menopause is that there is at once nothing written about it and way too much written about it. Mm -hmm. And it's just the same thing over and over again. There's some really great things that have started coming along. There was a really good book whose name I'm going to screw up, so I won't even try the Darcy Stanky book. There was um, Sandra Singh Lowe wrote Mad Woman in a Volvo, which was hilarious. Um, but I still think like we're, we're wrestling with this topic. And it's such a big thing. And it's so interesting to me that science can't even tell us why it happens. Us and the pilot whales, why? Why do we hang around all of these decades after we cease to be able to have kids? Figure it out, science, please. So at the end of that essay, um, I think you joke that next time you're asked if you are your daughter's grandmother that you'll say, no, I am her great grandmother. I'm 80 years old or some such. And I am curious, yeah. did you, have you, has, has anyone been on the receiving end of that? Have you? Not yet. It's been a while since I've been asked if I, it's been a while, which is interesting since I've been asked if I'm her grandmother. But I think a lot of that is because she's older now. Mm -hmm. She's a lot with it can't process it. Right. Um, my kid has been finding out that I have zero patience for certain kinds of questions. We were just talking about this last week. I don't know why I'm this way. This is probably an essay in the making. <laughs> I want people in stores to talk to me about what I'm buying. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, personal, especially when it's food. Yeah. But it's like, in general, don't talk to me yeah. about what I'm buying. It's like, I, it's like, talk to me. I'm, I'm happy to talk. I'll talk about the weather. I'll talk about also, I'll talk about the news. Do not talk to me about purchases. That feels like, you know, like you have information about me that's very private and confidential. It's like, I wouldn't yeah. want, so, so we, we were at a store and we were buying school supplies and it's like notebooks, pens, glue, all, you know, dry erases. And the cashier's like, so shopping for school supplies i'm like no i just really like notebooks <laughs> <laughs> so, so my, oh my i love that <laughs> why would you say that i was like i don't know i'm probably wrong about this i don't know why it bothers me so much it happened when you're shopping for halloween candy i literally bought 10 pounds of candy it's like <laughs> october 30th and the person's like is this for halloween I'm like, no i <laughs> This is how much I've <laughs> every week. I'm not saying this is actually horrible behavior on my part, but I feel like at one point I'm going to write about why I don't want people to talk to me about what I'm buying. I think you should. I love that. That well, that reminds me of your Twitter essay and your. I mean, so the tweet that sent you to the principal's office. I mean, it was hilarious. I waited that whole essay to find out like what was the tweet, what was said, and it did not disappoint. It was incredible. So tell us, you know, what's your relationship with Twitter right now? Have you sent out any more tweets that have been um, landed you, if not in the principal's office, then, you know, in any type of hot water? Well, I'm, um, I have a really good relationship with social media and I kind of defend it in the book. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. A lot about the fact that, um, you know, the novel when it first came along was a really derided form. Yeah. And seen form for women and silly and superficial. Yeah. And I think social media, I don't think it's gendered that much, but I do think social media is often derided. <laughs> I got to tell you, a lot of the way I got, I've gotten through the pandemic is because I have Twitter friends. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, this, the grotto to whom the book is dedicated is a group of Twitter friends who talk in a private DM about writing. So I'm really pro social media, but another thing, and I don't think I've had a chance to write about this, but it's something that really obsesses me is that I'm pretty careful. And by, so when I say careful, like I'm not really seeking to give offense very often. I don't 
pick to pick fights. Sometimes I say strongly worded things, but for the most part, I'm there for fun or I'm there to like every now and then make a serious point. I mean, I'm very serious. I do these constant threads about what is genius and how are we going to think about genius and maybe we've got it backwards. And I don't really approve of the idea that genius is something that's achieved in a monastic state. And I think that's bad for everybody, men and women alike. But, you know, one of the big complaints of our modern culture is, oh, I guess I can't make jokes anymore. And people are like, oh, I can't make jokes anymore. And what they're really saying is that they have to think about what they're saying and they have to wonder if it will give offense. And I think that is just the whitest of white privileges to feel bad because you're being held accountable for what you say. Right. And I, and, and, but really just to say on Twitter, I was, um, I was talking again about, you know, it was, if you want to, you know, if you want to destroy the patriarchy, say so you feel great about yourself. And at one point I said, I don't know what the equivalent would be for a man. Um, and I, I, I threw out there, I said, and I said, just man. And I, then I threw out, I was like, I guess a man's equivalent of saying, I like the way I look would be every woman I've ever been with has had an orgasm. And I cracked up because one of my dearest friends, Greg Heron, a writer who lives in New Orleans, who happens to be gay, immediately wrote, excuse me? <laughs> I say, white heterosexual men, Greg, okay, and then it, and then it just <laughs> going from there. And that's a moment where it was very lighthearted, but yeah, someone could have taken offense. And I consider it to be a great opportunity to think about words I'm using, ways I'm expressing myself. I'm fascinated by evolving bias. Um, my assistant and I are going through my books right now Oh. And looking for things that over 20 years might now give offense. Oh, interesting. And it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to change them, but maybe I'll write new afterwards. And I'll just come up with one example. Um, in the first test book, which was published in 1997 and written in 1995, mm -hmm. um, the man who will become her boyfriend, et cetera, et cetera, is in a band called Poe, P-O-E, White Trash, which... Poe White Trash, I thought was pretty darn hilarious in 1997. But White Trash is a really problematic term. And the way we experienced that term in 1997 is different in 2020. Right. And we really unpacked it now. I mean, we all, I, I, the sentient people knew in 1997 that the existence of a term like White Trash had some really complicated subtext and implications, but it still kind of floated by. It was still kind of like, it's still scant. It doesn't now. So it's like, I, I'm kind of looking at that. Um, you know, I think one of the, the big arcs for me is to look at the way, at the language I've used over the years um, about people who are transsexual. Uh -huh. uh, dealing, you know, and I, I hate people. I hate people who complain about the pronouns. I was so moved the other day that a woman I know has a daughter who's a year younger than mine, and her child has announced that her pronouns are now they them. And I think that's cool. I think that's great. And she thinks it's great. I mean, she was, you know, embracing it. And I the people who want to moan about it and want to moan about it's too hard and I can't keep up and I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Well, you know, I would say to the people who are worried that they don't know what they're supposed to say, wouldn't this be a great time to listen? Yes. And learn what an opportunity, maybe listen more and find out what people want to hear and how they want to see themselves described. And anyway, I don't even know how I that you're talking about social media so I'm, I'm pretty careful about social media I haven't gotten in much trouble the most trouble I trouble the worst thing that ever happened to me on social media is and 
alcohol does seem to be connected. I'm always a little tipsy. <laughs> Not, although not with the Tweety Bird tweet, I was stone cold sober on that one. Um, I was late at night, people were talking about Confederate monuments, and I said, as a native Southerner who's, who has ancestors that fought for the South, I would like to see all Confederate monuments come down. Went to bed. I woke up the next morning oh, no. to like a Twitter investigation into is Laura Littman lying about being a native Southerner? Oh my gosh. Oh, that she's really a Jewish woman from Maryland. Oh um, my gosh. It's so like, well, Maryland's anyway, it, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me on Twitter. I somehow wandered into these, you know, these pretty bad trolls and, and, and yeah. that's, in general, in general, I'm treated very well on social media. Good. I'm glad. So everyone here, follow Laura. It will be enlightening and entertaining. Um, and I'll hop back over here to some of these reader questions. So um, we have one question. What was the most fun essay for you to write? And that one has a second part, which is what exactly have you been drinking during this um, interview tonight? Oh, I was drinking a dogfish head. I had a beer. I, I was drinking a beer. I'm feeling, you know, my family's having a crab feast as I'm up here. Um, so what was the most fun to write? That's a really good question. You know, I'm going to say that for me, the most fun essay to write was Saving Mrs. Banks, which is oh. a straight up Valentine to the world's greatest babysitter. I'll say her name, I'll say her first name. I feel like Sarah, who was the woman who took care of my daughter from the age of six months to about four and a half years old, was the greatest. She was the greatest. And I felt like I had never read an essay where someone could just say, wow, this person who's taking care of my kid is so much better at it than I am and that's okay doesn't make me a failure. It doesn't, it is like, but I really, you know, got to kind of dig down into how the nanny in these stories is, in most stories is presented as, she's here for your personal growth. The nanny passes through your life and changes everything. And then when she goes, everybody's better. And, you know, I didn't feel like Sarah passed through my life to make me a better person. I just feel like I won the lottery, man. I mean, I, Sarah was the greatest. I, I, I've actually had, I'm going to knock one on this. I have had such good karma with the people who helped me. Um, Molly, who works for me now, is primarily my assistant, but has also helped me out with my daughter, and she's the greatest. I like, mm -hmm. I, if this is the kind of luck I get that I have the great luck of wonderful people who help me, I'll take it. Oh, uh, yeah. I loved writing Saving Mrs. Banks because I love Sarah so much and I wanted to just try to make a tribute to her that was worthy of her. I just, she's such a wonderful person and she was so important to my daughter, is so important to my daughter. But I also wanted to tell you, talk about like these essays, they start in this place and then they go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm when I really bore down and looked into what was going on in 2010 when my kid was born, and it was not a hyperbole. Every crib in the country was being out. I was like, can't have that crib, can't have that crib. No, not that one, not that one. It was oh my like gosh. The bumble seat and the car seat. It was just sort of like I had brought this kid into the world and I was so ill prepared for it. <laughs> Oh my God. It's like, just, just like, <laughs> you felt like you're in a fairy tale, like full of, in a forest with like deadly trees with, you know, it's like, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to not kill this baby. Oh my God. <laughs> Tells me I'm going to kill my baby. So I love having Mrs. Banks because I loved being able to just say full throatedly, I had the greatest babysitter in the world and I was a total idiot. And I didn't actually even become a decent mom until I had to become one. And even then, I'm still not sure I'm up to Sarah's standards, which is not. Thank you. 
This is making me think um, of Jay Courtney Sullivan's new book, Friends and Strangers, about that nanny relationship. I'm curious if you've read that, but that also um, leads it's me to another. Oh, good. Just oh, it's a delight. I think you'll like it. Um, but that we have a question here. You know, what authors are you really enjoying these days? Okay, so. Um... Wow. Okay. That's a good one. I just finished, I did an event last night with Liz Lenz who wrote Belabored. Oh yes. yes, yes. It's a really beautiful memoir, personal essay, reporting. Uh, to me, it really maps out the way our culture tries to own women's bodies. And she does it through the lens of a woman who has been pregnant, um, which is, she's had two children and she's miscarried. So she, but it's so much more universal. It's like she writes very specifically, but it feels very universal. Um, I have read Ruman Alam's Leave the World Behind, which is coming out this fall and is an amazing book. It's kind of perfect for the time we're living in. Um, I'm about to read a book by Amy Gentry of Texas, who's a wonderful young up and coming crime writer. Um, I am willing to commit major crimes to get my hands on Megan Abbott's new book, which is oh, about yes. mm -hmm. answer. It's already been an option for television. Um, I've been reading Sarah Wyman's edited collection, Unspeakable Acts, which is, I have there, I mean, we could talk another hour. I have a really complicated relationship with true crime stories, but Sarah is really smart, really ethical, and she has really brought together a very special wonderful collection um, that is very conscious of the pitfalls of true crime writing and avoids them. And it's what I would say, oh gosh, what else is there? I, I'm trying to think of all the books I ordered today. I ordered Isabel Wil Wilkerson's Case. Um, I ordered David Joy's new book, hmm. title I will forget immediately. And David suggested that I order a book of short stories, which I'm not sure how we're supposed to say the title. It's a book of short stories. It's F asterisk CK face. Oh. So just to say it out loud or how you say it, but I, he told me it was fantastic. Huh. I ordered that. I'm trying to, I, I ordered a lot. I got, I, I was, I, I'm going to have some downtime soon. And I was like, let's go crazy reading. Um, yeah, and it, it's been all, reading has been one of the things I've struggled with the most during the pandemic. I've had to read a lot of short stories and essays. Um, focusing on novels has been harder. I don't know why. I, mm -hmm. I think as writing a novel kind of exhausted all of my power to focus. That right. was well, and we have a question here. Is it easier to write fiction or nonfiction? What would you say to that? We only have a minute or two left, but. It's so much easier just to make stuff up. <laughs> you know, in a book like this where it seems like it's all personal, if you look at the um, essay on menopause, which begins with this long digressive piece about integration in Baltimore City Public Schools, I did so much research on that and uh, you know i couldn't get anyone to answer my question about how western high school a public high school in baltimore has been able never to have a male student it's something i'm so very curious about mm -hmm. you know something like that you just go down these rabbit holes of research you know you find yourself reading about pilot whales and <laughs> why, why do pilot whales live so long after you see? so i would much rather make stuff up uh, yeah, it's easier. It's definitely easier. And before we hop off, we have someone here who is really excited about the new children's book that you are writing with your daughter. Um, so question, what age will that one be geared toward? Well, it's going to appear in a magazine called Kazoo, which is geared okay. toward um, girls between five and 12. I would say it's going to really be right there at that sweet spot of nine and 10 year olds. My daughter's mm -hmm. 10. Her job in the collaboration is to make me sound like a 10 year old. And she's already kind <laughs> and said, no, not this word, that word, or I think I would say it this way. And I'm like, okay, you're, that's why, you know, that's why we're working together. So oh, um, I think it's a fun project. project, but it is a really fun project. I'm, I'm, it's also, it's set in the summer of 2020. Oh, well, from the point of, I 
mean, it doesn't, it's really not about the pandemic, but it touches on the idea of what it's like for kids right now to hear that, okay, this is a historic time and you're gonna remember this forever. And one day you're gonna tell your kids and your grandkids and you're gonna tell them that they're actually hidden delights and unexpected pleasures. And my daughter's just like, do I have again? Oh, I love that. Well, all right. It looks like we're about out of time here. Um, Laura, we've had lots of comments roll in that are just saying thank you to you. Um, we have someone saying, you know, she's been struggling with her teenage daughter and her weight ideals and how much she appreciates, um, you know, your assessment. So just know, you know, we have lots of comments of people here who appreciate you and your writing. And it's been such a delight to get to talk to you and hear some more about these essays. It's great to talk to you again. And thank you for this thoughtful lovely interview i couldn't ask her anything more this has been a wonderful evening wonderful well everyone check out my life as a villainess follow laura on twitter and um thank you all and i will see you next time bye everybody <laughs>